Oh. Good morning. morning. Got to get myself mic'd up here. Okay, reminder, after worship, we're having a governing board meeting. Just be uh, right over there. And Wednesdays, we're going to, I just sort of did a a freebie this Wednesday for the Bible Fellowship. We're going to continue the uh, Wesley studies, looking at the Sermons on the Mount, or the Sermon on the Mount, which, yeah, good stuff. Uh, Thursday, September the 17th, um, the Lay Leadership Committee is going to meet. You should receive notification in the mail if you're on that committee. And then Sunday, September the 20th, the UMW is going to have a bizarre planning meeting, and that is an open all-church meeting, so it's at, right after the service. So, yeah, in here. Okay, we can all go over there. Okay, yeah, but all in attendance, welcome. Everybody's welcome to participate. Sunday, October 4th is World Communion Sunday, so we're going to have a conference special offering for that. Then on Thursday, October the 8th at 6 p.m., we're having our charge conference. It's going to, again, be a cluster conference. Wheeler was kind enough to offer to host it again. They're very roomy over there. And we're going to have that with McLean and Heald and Wheeler and Allison. And that'll be on October the 8th. Saturday, the no- November the 14th, is going to be uh, the annual bazaar. Oh, gosh, they're having the charge conference on my birthday. Oh, October, right. All right, all right, all right. You're right, you're right. I'm wrong. That's a relief. Yes, Lee? part of the UMW, but if we meet in the fellowship hall, we can write things down. Okay. So it'd be harder to write things down sitting in the pew, I think. So yeah. I think and and, it, and it gives people who really have somewhere else to be the opportunity to slip away without having to walk out on it. Sure. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to stand at the doors going, oh, right over here, right over here. And also the um, finance committee meeting is having a meeting on this Wednesday at 10. And we'll finish up if we need to on Thursday at 10. Oh, it's on Wednesday? Sunday school room, yeah. Okay. Reminder, still receiving Operation Christmas Child donations. Uh, September, there's a special focus on collecting games, but uh, we're coming down to the, we're getting near the point, so I think it's just everything and anything. Anything you want to bring is fine. Games can include soccer balls. Oh, yeah, soccer balls. Remember, you can get a little pump, too, with it. yeah. And I went to a meeting yesterday in Amarillo, project leaders meeting, and there was lots of good information. And yes, we're still having collection week. Yes, they're still having the processing centers. If anybody's interested in going to the processing center, get in touch with me. Sign up is start September 30th. And in normal years, think places go fast. This year, I don't know how it's gonna happen. It's all up in the air, but they are taking precautions for safety. And, but they're going to do it. I mean, they're having tr- faith in God that it will, it's going to work and it's going to be good and it's a good, great ministry to continue to keep doing. And these kids need, these kids in the world need this touch of joy now more than ever. So it was a great meeting. All right. Okay. Uh, yep, just a reminder, our email address is shamrockumc at gmail.com. And you can find audio of our messages on SoundCloud or videos of the worship service on YouTube. In both cases, just look for Shamrock UMC. So looking forward to a great time of worship. Let's begin to prepare our hearts and minds as we hear the prelude together.
Thank you, Georgia. Our opening hymn this morning is He is Lord. It's in your red hymnal on page 177. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing through it two times. As we prepare for our time of prayer, I ask if any of you have joys uh, or concerns that you'd like to share so that we could pray about them together. Uh, Garland and Rachel. And all the people that are being infected by these wildfires. It's kind of scary out there. <coughs> yes, sir. Last week I asked you to pray for my daughter, Christine. I would really like prayers for Michelle. As you all know, she's incarcerated. But she had surgery. They took her down to Galveston Hospital and she had surgery on her knee because she had an infection in the artificial knee. And in the, when she had the accident where her thigh bone, they had to put in a rod. And um, I 
they don't call you, they don't call the next of kin that is listed, which is her sister. They don't call and tell you anything. We won't know until she gets back to her regular unit how she's doing. So I just, it, it's got to be a lonely heart that she's having. And I just pray that you would ask God to just hug her up. Other joys or concerns? Jared, my friend, Merle McCaskill, lost her husband. If y'all would pray for her. Could you say the name again, Merle please? McCaskill. Merle. Merle. I know, it's all a bunch of guys' names, but we run around together. I've got a Frankie <laughs> and a Merle and a Pete. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and merciful God, we come before you to give you thanks that Christ is truly king, that the power of your spirit is present to us, his church, and that we are able even now to live and reign with him according to your spirit. We pray today for all those who are not able to be here, especially for Rachel and Garland, and we want you to watch over all those who are in isolation right now. We remember most especially Michelle. We ask that she might enjoy a swift recovery from her surgery. But we ask also that in this time of her isolation, you might come to her as the one who sets the prisoners free that you would comfort her heart in this moment when she must feel so very alone. Without friends to comfort her, confronted by the weakness of her mortal body, bring her the powerful life of your spirit, remind her of what she knows, restore her to the joy of your salvation. We pray also for Christine. This morning, we think about the wildfires that are burning, the people who have lost their homes, some even their lives. We cannot but pray that you would help them put an end to the fires, to bring an end to the destruction to bring them to a place of comfort that they might begin to rebuild their lives. We ask that you would pour out your spirit on all your people there to reach out, to witness to those in distress that there is a life and an inheritance that we can receive from you that nothing in this world can take away. We ask that you would be with Merle this morning and in the days ahead as she mourns the loss of her husband. Do, Father, continue to be the God of all consolation and comfort to those who this day are in grief and suffering the heartache of the loss of a loved one. We come before you today and admit that in our attitudes and our actions, we have not been all that you created and called us to be. We occasionally forget the greatness of your blessings toward us. And so we fail to fully bless others as we ought. We almost take for granted at times the limitless depth of your love and forgiveness and in such absent-mindedness, perhaps we have thoughtlessly withheld love and forgiveness from others. In our misguided efforts to preserve our own dignity, we insist upon our rights. We cling to bitterness, to hurt, to anger and disappointment, rather than letting go in faith and trust, releasing ourselves to the spirit of forgiveness and mercy that is able to heal and cleanse us through the power of the Spirit. 
Forgive us. Forgive us for our willingness to settle for so much less than you desire to accomplish in and through us. And remove all our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. Cast them into the depths of the sea and restore us to right relationship with you and with one another for the sake of your Son, our Savior, our friend, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. It's 133 in your red hymnal. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing all three verses. <laughs> is Romans 14, 1 through 4, and 13 through 19. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of others? It is before their own Lord they stand or fall and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, 
but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be spoken of evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Our gospel reading is Matthew 18, 21 through 35. And then Peter came to him and said, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions in payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. And his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, and then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the fellow slaves saw what happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. And so my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The reading of Romans is almost a review of last week. One of the things I focused on when Jesus was talking about how we ought to handle conflicts in the church um, was that he said, go and talk to your brother or sister and if they listen to you, you have regained them or you have gained them. It's, it's a word that can be used for gaining profit and business, but it's also the word that's used to win people for the kingdom. The point is not to get what's coming to you. The whole thought is for the restoration of the other. And Paul says that at the very end of this passage. Let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding and edification. And then Peter comes along with this question, how often should I forgive? And Jesus typically wants to make the answer quite clear, oddly, so he gives a parable. Before we get into it, I wanna just discuss briefly that there's sort of a mixture going on here. The previous passage we talked about last week was specifically about how people who call themselves Christian are supposed to manage their conflicts and we are supposed to manage them. We're not supposed to let things fester and lie. But in terms of those outside the community, we're actually not supposed to judge at all. Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5.12 writes, what have I to do with judging those outside? Is it not those who are inside that you are to judge? Again, in this positive sense of restoration. God will judge those on the outside. And the reason this is important is because we're supposed to preserve the witness of the community. Christ was very clear about that in the Gospel of John. He says, by this they shall know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And we know that commandment very well from the New Testament, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But we don't often go back and look at the context and where it originally appears, which is, of all places, in the book of Leviticus, where it begins, you shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. And that doesn't just mean hate, it can mean treat us con with contempt. Just sort of cut yourself off, uh, don't acknowledge them. And what it gives as a contrast to hate is not immediately love, it says you shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. 
Now, I highlighted some of the ways in which we don't at all follow Jesus' advice last week, but I, I want to give due credit uh, where it's due. Our way of handling things, I know it's certainly mine, is often if we have a little tete-a-tete, we cool down afterwards and we're pretty sure both people just regret it happened. And the next time we meet, we act like nothing happened. And that's a bid for reconciliation. And often we'll just accept it. But if we don't mean it, if we're still harboring something in our heart, we've really got to bring it up with them. Because as this commandment in Leviticus goes on, you shall not take vengeance by continuously turning the cold shoulder, by saying little spiteful things, uh, or bear a grudge so you shan't let it fester. I can't believe I just used shan't, reading too much English things. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's where it comes from. So it involves more than just this sort of disembodied abstract notion of love. It's always in some sort of a, a concrete setting. The message of this parable is pretty much bringing at home what Jesus made perfectly clear when he was explaining the meaning of the Lord's Prayer, which we just prayed. It's in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. He says, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow. And when we think of others and when we think of loving our neighbor, I want to suggest that even in this passage, though, Peter is specifically asking about a brother or sister. This commandment of, of love really applies to the neighbor and therefore it applies to everyone. When someone was similarly asking Jesus, who is my neighbor, hoping that he could at least, you know, get off the hook for some people, he told the parable of the Good Samaritan. The point being that Neighbor isn't something that's externally defined. It's neighbor is something that happens in your heart by how you choose to treat people. And this, especially the conclusion of this parable, can be kind of frightening. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Not just with the lips, but actually, really, and truly from the heart. Why would this be so important? because it is the gospel. The whole problem, cover to cover, in the Bible is what sin has done to us. That is the problem. Even the baptism of John, which was for the forgiveness of sins, well, it was to prepare a highway for the Lord. They were getting ready for the forgiveness of sins, the deliverance that Jesus would bring about, the ministry of God's grace and God's mercy. They were simply being prepared for it. When Peter first called people to repentance in the Gospel of Acts, he went through the list of everything you're supposed to do, believe, believe, repent, be baptized, so that your sins may be forgiven. It is for the forgiveness of sins. That is the Gospel. That is how God is reconstituting the kingdom of God. That is the word from our king, forgiveness. And we're also warned in other places in Scripture to make room for the wrath of God. It's interesting. I, I really don't know what's gonna happen when God finally and fully deals with evil at the second coming or what that, that judgment will look like. But it's often described as a fiery furnace. And I wanna suggest that whatever we might have in our hearts, no matter how badly we've been injured, to hold on to that grudge would be as though we struck a little match and we're jumping into the fiery furnace after them to hold it under their nose. This is not a place we want to go. We've been given the ministry of grace and mercy. But how do we pull this off? I mean, there's so much evil in the world, and I don't think we're wrong when it, we see how awful it is, all the terrible things that some people do, the terrible things that happen. We're not wrong in our perception. But I wanna ask you, what do you make of Jesus' introduction to this parable, the background that we sort of miss? The guy, what, he lost 10,000 talents? And then he's shaking somebody down from, for 100 denarii. We have difficulty understanding numbers this big, so I wanna see if I can give you a couple of illustrations. The average worker's daily pay was about one denarii. 
assuming they're going to work about 300 days a year, one talent, which is 6,000 denarius, is 20 years work. 10,000 talents would be 20,000 years. So this is, this is a big difference. One person calculated it up and he said, well, what if we imagine a denarius is like a 20 pence piece? He said, you could carry the 100 denarii that this man owed in your pocket, but for the 10,000 talents, uh, you would need 8,600 carriers carrying bags that weighed 60 pounds each, and if they were a yard apart, the line would be five miles long. That's if they're silver talents. For in money today, uh, it would be about six billion dollars as opposed to maybe 10 grand if it's a silver talent. If it's a gold talent, it'd be more like 180 billion. This is supposed to give us the idea that the debt that we owe to God, the offense that we've given to God, is just incomparable. Our minds are not capable of dealing with these kinds of numbers. Not to say that the evils that we perceive in the world aren't as bad as we think they are, they're probably worse but we grossly underestimate the sin which has been forgiven us, the offense that all human beings or humanity collectively have given to God by rejecting the author of life. And the mere fact of the cross shows what we would do to God if we got the chance. So in that comparison, I don't think Jesus is lying. And Oh, this is an interesting illustration, I just love it. Uh, a man asks a woman to marry him, and she says, well, I'll marry you in a million seconds, or I'll give you my answer in a million seconds. Or she says, I'll give you my answer in a billion seconds. Our brains, we don't really understand it. A million seconds is 12, 12 and a half days. Well, that's not so bad. A billion seconds is 32 years. He needs to ask someone else. So we're not really supposed to comprehend this grasp. This isn't an invitation for us to think of how terribly we've sinned against God, but just to keep it in mind, to try to remind ourselves that there is a perspective here so that maybe it can help us hold a little less tightly the injuries that we have received ourselves. I found something that C.S. Lewis wrote on forgiveness because I thought it was interesting. He said that when he was praying for forgiveness, he found he was often asking to be excused, that he would find himself going over, well, there was extenuating circumstances. You know, I really, I didn't have the time. I was tired, I was hungry. The other person was partially at fault. He said, that's not asking for forgiveness. Even after you excuse everything that can be excused, you still have the inexcusable remainder. That's what you ask forgiveness for. And he thought to himself that God knows all the excuses much better than I do. And I'm sure I'll, one day I'll find out that perhaps on some occasions I sin much less than I thought and on others much more than I thought. But he said that this same tendency we, we have for ourselves, we should apply to others. We should take the best possible view of whatever it is that they have done. Maybe they didn't understand. Maybe they were confused. Maybe they didn't intend to do what they did. We should make every excuse we can for them, but then with the inexcusable remainder, we must forgive them because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us. Now, he didn't make this point, but what I drew from it was an interesting thought. Wouldn't it be a temptation to magnify the sins against ourselves so that we could feel so great and so gracious for being so forgiving? So that though we don't notice it, the treasure in our heart is actually a treasury of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love does not count up wrongs or is not resentful in that way. But we can actually fall into the trap of remembering all the wrongs that have been done to us so that we can feel like forgiving people. We should be careful of that trap. It is very possible. We're not really concerned so much with ourselves. We trust the Lord for ourselves, we're supposed to maintain an interest in others. When I read this parable, it made me think that what's truly troubling, not just many people, but actually many nations, is a spirit of unforgiveness. 
that tendency to just heap up wrongs. I've made this point before, and I want to make it again, that it's perfectly possible for your moral compass to be pointed in the right direction. It lines up with scripture, it lines up with the word of God, but the spirit driving you is pointed 100 degrees, 180 degrees in the opposite direction. So that those who are out seeking justice seem to be extraordinarily unmerciful at times, almost malicious. Their pursuit of injustice involves hauling people onto the carpet, humiliating them, perhaps calling for them to be fired, making sure that they're excluded from society. This doesn't sound like the spirit of Christ, the spirit of mercy, the spirit of restoration. Yeah, you can have your compass pointed at justice, but your spirit can be pointed in exactly the wrong direction. And forgiveness does not excuse us from pursuing justice. It's just that we do it with a different spirit. It doesn't excuse us from testifying in court. It doesn't excuse us from upholding the law. It doesn't give us a break in that sense. But we do it, we pursue justice with a quite a different spirit and quite a different goal than the world. 1972 was an interesting year. The reason I picked 1972 is because I'm basically going to borrow heavily from an article that was written by Corey Ten Boom, who, as you may know, was hiding Jews from the Nazis during World War II, was detected, captured, and sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp with her sister Betsy, who did not survive. In 1972, she wrote an article for Guideposts in which she talked about forgiveness in a very powerful way and much better than I could really come up with. But before I get to it, I want to remind you a few things about 1972, if you were around at the time. 1972 was a time of great turmoil. The arrest for the Watergate break-in occurred in 1972. A presidential candidate, George Wallace, was shot and permanently paralyzed in 1972. In 1972, the provisional IRA set off 33 bombs in Belfast. They set off three car bombs in Canbury, England. In 1972, the Red Army faction in Munich also bombed the US barracks. In 1972, the Black September terrorist group murdered a bunch of Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics. In 1972, a race riot broke out on a United States aircraft carrier on its way to the Vietnam theater. In 1972, guideposts had the wisdom to know that people had forgotten the spirit of forgiveness. And I think that's why they asked Corey Ten Boom to write something. Her article begins with her most famous story, how she was in Munich preaching on forgiveness to the people of Germany after the war because they were a broken people. She didn't just preach to her friends, she preached to her enemies. And because she was from Holland, she thought, and was very close to the sea, she always liked to think of forgiveness as God taking our sins and throwing them into the sea to be forever buried at the bottom of it. She had just finished her lecture and everyone was standing up and leaving silently when she saw a man stand up in a gray overcoat, balding with a a brown felt hat crushed in his hands, and he started pressing his way forward. And as he did, she no longer saw the gray overcoat and the brown felt hat. She had a flash of the man in his German uniform, wearing his cap with a skull and crossbones, a member of the Gestapo, who had been right there when she and her sister had entered the concentration camps. He's pressing forward, and she's remembering the harsh lights in that room the humiliation of having to walk past him naked, the pathetic piles of dresses and shoes heaped up on the floor around her, and perhaps most of all, the emaciated figure of her sister right in front of her, her sharp ribs under her parchment skin standing out. And the man pressed forward and came all the way up to her, and he stretched out his hand and he says, a fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And she froze. She began to fumble with her pocketbook to stall for time, as though she didn't know what was happening. I was a um, 
he said that during the war, I was a guard at Ravensbrook. So he hadn't remembered her. How could he with so many thousands filing past him? And he says, since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, and again the hand came forward, will you forgive me? And for a horrible moment she froze. It was probably just a few seconds, but it felt like forever, but she knew she had to do it. She had been forgiven, so also she must forgive. It wasn't in her heart to do it. She said a quick prayer, Jesus help me. Because she knew that forgiveness is not a feeling, it's an act of the will. Woodenly, she wrote, almost mechanically, she stuck out her hand. And then she reports that like electricity coming from her shoulder to the point where their hands were joined, she suddenly began to feel warmth and healing spread through her body. That's a, an oft-repeated story. In this article, she goes on a little bit. She says, you would have thought after that of course, that I had no problem forgiving anyone for anyone, anything. She wished she could say that it wasn't true. Years later, a group of her close friends, fellow Christians, had hurt her rather deeply, and she found herself just seething over it, going over it again and again in her mind, and of course she eventually realized, yes, she must forgive them too, so she finally asked God to help her forgive, and then she, as she said, forgave them in cold blood. Some people murder in cold blood. She forgave in cold blood. And again, she felt that warmth, that healing. But something troubling happened. In the days ahead, she was waking up in the middle of the night and finding herself rehashing the same thing, all the things that had been said and done, night after night. I've forgiven this, why does it keep coming back? I forgive them, I forgive them. She finally got a little help from a Lutheran pastor that she was visiting with, and she had recounted this experience to him, this confusing experience, why can't I forgive? And what he did is he pointed out the window and he said, you see that tower over there? There's a bell in that tower. You ring the bell by pulling on the rope, but even after the sexton lets go of the rope, the bell keeps swinging and it keeps ringing, ding, dong, ding, dong, until as it's slowing down with a final dong, it finally quits. He believed that forgiveness was much like that, and I've found that myself. Things will keep racing back. I'll find myself pouring over them again. And every time though, the length of time between the thoughts come back, and I say to myself, this is forgiven. That time grows shorter, and shorter and shorter, until that painful memory is no more than a fly in my face, easily brushed away. But God wasn't done teaching Corey Ten Boom a lesson about forgiveness. An American friend visited her, to whom she had preached about this ding-dong principle of forgiveness. And as this American friend walked in, her friends were walking out, and he asked after they had left, aren't those the friends that you were talking about in your message about the ding-dong principle of forgiveness? Yes, she said, and she said she felt she was saying it rather smugly. You can see all is forgiven. Well, I can see that you have forgiven them, but have they received your forgiveness? Immediately, no, they don't even think they did anything wrong. They don't admit that there's anything to forgive, but I have proof. And she ran over to her desk, opened the drawer. I have it in black and white. I've got all the letters. And her friend came over and put his arm in hers, gently closed the drawer and said, aren't you the one whose sins are at the bottom of the deepest sea? Why are their sins in black and white at the bottom of your drawer? The point hit home, and before she could go to sleep that night, she took out those letters and she fed them page by page into her coal-burning stove. And she, she said, as the flames leapt up, my heart glowed again with warmth. She knew that forgiveness was important because she actually served helping other members of concentration camps 
after the war and she noted a consistent principle. Those who were able to forgive were able to go on and rebuild their lives, regardless of the physical scars. Those who could not forgive languished. They were never able to recover. They illustrated something Frednick Beekner said about nursing grievances, about anger in particular. He said, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontations still to come, to savor to the last morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The only problem is, the thing you're devouring is yourself. The skeleton at the end of the feast, the bones left rattling on the platter, are you. She knew this. That's why forgiveness was so important. And I believe it is important for more than that because this is where we get the log out of our own eye. This is where we actually get to the point where we can help other people. We can stop being a part of the spirit of getting even and really be a spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. If we are in Christ, we also will be reconciling the world to God in Christ. The spirit of unforgiveness is a very bad place to be. The spirit of forgiveness is a very, very safe place to be. In terms of paying people back, we know that Jesus' advice was stark. He said, love your enemies. Do beautiful things to those who hate you. If they curse you, repay them with blessings. If they abuse you, return that abuse by praying for them. Offer your enemy Christ. Offer Christ to the thief. Offer Christ to the murderer. Offer, Offer Christ to the rapist. Offer Christ to everyone. Christ is the one who's actually able to fix the problem and not continue the cycle. If we do not receive his grace in vain, that's a warning that the author of Hebrews gives us. He says, do not receive the grace of Christ in vain. And then he explains what he means. Do not let a root of bitterness spring up, lest many thereby become defiled. To receive the grace of Christ is to receive that spirit of forgiveness, to become free from that anger that is so destructive. I know many people often quote that psalm, be angry and do not sin. But that's, that's just repeating the principle. When you're pointing a finger, there's three pointed right back at you. When you're angry, we'll go right back to yourself and make sure that you're right. Come back to that place of grace and then you'll be able to do the work that Christ gave us. There really was a dividing point in history at the time of the cross. This ministry wasn't possible before the Holy Spirit was given to us to actually heal broken hearts. This is what we've been given to do. This is what we've been called to be, a forgiven and a forgiving people. This is the Spirit of Christ. So if we do not receive that grace in vain, None of the evils the world can throw at us will be able to distract us or deceive us or make us forget that forgiveness, the mercy of God in Jesus Christ, isn't just the treatment. It is the cure for everything that ails us and everything that ails the whole world. The church of Jesus Christ truly has been given everything the world needs. We have through Christ the power to make ourselves and others whole. Let us not receive it in vain, at this time particularly. For that, let us give thanks to God every day. As it says in the book of Lamentations, 
after the Babylonians have killed I don't know how many people and dragged them off to captivity, his mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. With God's grace and the help of the Spirit, we can step up to that faithfulness. That's who we've been called to be. Let's not forget it. Amen. I remind everyone that the offering plates are at the rear of the sanctuary on the center aisle. If you forgot to give an offering on the way in and you'd like to give one on the way out, you certainly may do so. I now ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Most merciful God, through Christ's sacrifice, you have removed the burden of our sin and flooded our lives with righteousness, peace, and joy through the Holy Spirit. Help us not to continue to follow along with a world that is intent on keeping scores and settling debts. May the gifts we give this morning help continue and strengthen this church's ministry of grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, according to the will of the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to whom be glory forever. Amen.
Serve the Lord with patience and passion. Be deliberate in enacting your faith. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, forgive others, so that peace may be your way of life. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.